Welcome back. This is part two of a video on Riemann's treatment of potential and abelian functions. If you haven't seen part one yet, I strongly recommend that you do, and then come back to this video. Let's continue to look at the most essential characteristic of economics. It seems to be fundamentally composed of discontinuities, of breaks, of jumps. A new creative discovery makes things possible that simply could not have existed before. As an example, consider the Apollo moon mission, launched by President Kennedy. Going to the moon costs quite a bit of money, and there are many estimates of the payback. The new technologies that were developed revolutionized many aspects of production and economy. The cultural benefits seem almost unquantifiable. But let's take, as a, as, a, as a basis, let's take the figure arrived at by Chase Econometrics. This firm estimated a return of up to $14 for every dollar invested in the moonshot. But let me ask you, even if this were a good estimate, were the $14 that we got back the same as the dollars that we spent? No. What was different about them? To answer this question, let's compare two different kinds of computerized machine tools first developed during and for the Apollo mission, known as CNC, Computer Numerical Control Systems. We're going to compare a three-axis mill and a five-axis mill. For this three-axis mill, the cutting implement moves in the x and y directions, back and forth, and also up and down in the z direction. The computer coordinates these motions to create 3D shapes, such as the one we see here. With a five-axis mill, two additional motions are added. In this case, the cutting head tilts and rotates. Such a machine is capable of making more complex forms, such as that you see here. A piece like this, if it were made from a particularly hard alloy, could literally take days or weeks to machine without computer numerical control in a five-axis mill. If we compare these two produced shapes, they are both three-dimensional in space, but the two additional dynamic dimensions of action of the five-axis mill allow it to create a whole slew of shapes that are simply impossible with simpler equipment. How would an accountant represent the higher value of five-axis machining? This is an excellent analogy for changes in the economy as a whole, with the introduction of new principles, such as electricity, the germ theory of disease, and fertilizer production, just to name a few. Now, let's examine this concept of incommensurable jumps in geometry to lead us into Riemann's treatment of abelian functions. Our first example of incommensurability comes from Plato's Mino dialogue, in which Plato Socrates confronts an uneducated slave boy with what seems to be a simple geometric problem. How do you construct a square that's twice as large as a given square? What would you do? In the dialogue, the boy's first guess is to double the sides of the square. But, as Socrates points out, that actually creates a square with four times the original area. The boy thinks about it, and his next guess is to try a length of one and a half. This adds an area equal to a half, plus a half, and then some. So it's also too large. It's more than double. With a bit of prompting from Socrates, the boy considers this crooked square. If you look at what it's made out of, it's composed of four triangles, which is twice as many as the two that made up the original square. That means it is twice as large as the original square. Now, while Socrates certainly provoked the boy to think about this in the first place, that ability to recognize that the doubled square really is double, that already lay in the boy's mind. It's as though he was simply remembering something that he already knew. Now, since we didn't make this crooked square by starting with the length, like the other ones, 
we don't yet know how long its side is. So, let's figure it out. The longer side is made of the original side, plus a certain remainder. How big is the remainder? Well, it goes into the original side two times, with another small remainder left over. How big is that remainder? Well, it goes into the previous remainder two times with a little bit left over. I think you can see from the picture here that this construction will continue similarly forever. If we were to write the doubled square side as a fraction of the original side, we would get this continued fraction. It's 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2 and so on. This is because that it's made of one of the original side plus a piece which goes into it two times plus a little bit more, which itself goes into the first remainder two times plus a little bit more, and so on. This continued fraction would go on forever. The side of the doubled square, the square root of two, lies beyond all fractions, resting literally infinitely far away. So this square has a simple area, but its length does not even exist as a length. If you didn't have a two-dimensional area to draw on, you could never make the side of the doubled square simply by working with length and alone. Adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing won't do it. None of the infinite number of fractions correspond to this length, just as a three-axis mill could never have made the five-axis produce part that we saw earlier. We've simply gone beyond the whole infinite power of fractions, and the side of the doubled square is said to be incommensurable, since it cannot be measured as a length. When you write that funny symbol and you say the square root of two, you're actually writing a riddle or a question. What's the length of a square of area two? The higher power of area shows up in the smaller power of lengths as lying in between the cracks, or beyond the infinite. That's what happens whenever you try to look at a greater process using the language or understanding of a lesser one that's unable to bring it about. When you convey a big idea, you always have to do it paradoxically. As our next example, consider a circle. You could try to consider it as a polygon with an increasing number of sides. But no matter how many sides you add, well, the polygon is still made up of little bits of straightness, while the circle is fundamentally curved. Polygons might say that the circle has an infinite number of sides, but the circle knows better. Let's look at the circle in another way. Here you see rotation along a circle, along with two lengths. The arc along the circumference of the circle will be a measure for the angle, measured as the distance along the circumference that we've gone. The vertical line and the horizontal line you see have lengths that change repeatedly. The horizontal line is called the cosine, and the vertical line has the name sine. Let's try to write out algebra formulas for the sine and the cosine. Okay, here's the first guess and you can see it doesn't work that well. Let's try again. Hmm, that's better. It actually got a piece of a circle. Let me try a little bit harder. I just need some more terms here. Let's try this one. Success? Nope. All right, how about this one? Ah, looks like we got it. Nope, that one broke too. It seems pretty clear from this pattern that we'd need a formula that's infinitely long to make the circle. Here you see the result as we add up more and more and more terms up to 100. It keeps getting a little bit further before breaking off. So to go around forever, the simple repeated motion of a circle, the formula would also have to go along forever. Not a very satisfying definition. Interestingly, while the sine cannot be calculated in terms of the arc, it is possible to say exactly how the sine would change if the angle were doubled. There are expressible internal relationships in the domain of the circular functions, even though the functions themselves are transcendental. One final shape to investigate. 
the lemnus gate. This shape is made by inverting a hyperbola through a circle and is a higher transcendental than the circular functions. As we move along the arc of the lemnus gate, there is absolutely no formula for the blue length in terms of the arc, although the relationship between their changes is expressible. Nonetheless, some constructions are possible. Using the projected length on the right, we can create a complementary point on the lemnus gate, whose distance from the right side is the same as the other point's distance from the center, as measured along the arc. It's even possible to add, subtract, and multiply arc lengths, and know exactly how the blue length would change. Whew. So, let's review what we've gone over here. We had the normal numbers, simple fractions. Then we had an area number, the square root of 2, which was incommensurable to length numbers. Then we saw the circle, which was beyond the infinite of simple arithmetic and algebra. And finally, we have the lemnus gate, which cannot be approached even with the help of circles and catenaries. The Norwegian mathematician Niels Abel showed that the lemnus gate was really just the beginning of a whole series of transcendentals, each inexpressible from what came before just like the $14 payback from Apollo was not the same kind of dollar as the $1 invested in it. Now, despite these jumps, Abel showed that there were characteristics of the higher functions that could be foreseen. They could be understood as a series in some fashion. Riemann brought something startlingly new to Abel's work. He looked at functions not as symbols written on a piece of paper, or even the mathematical relationships between them. Going further, Riemann employed what was known to Leibniz as analysis situs to see the hidden dynamic geometry behind these relations. This is seen in Riemann's habilitation dissertation, where he develops the different possible curvatures that space could possibly have, saying that only physics, not mathematics, could justifiably give the basis for the shape of space. For our first example, let's go back to the circle, and we'll watch the vertical length, the sine, as it changes. Here, we trace it out as it moves around on the circle. Now, because the height of the sine repeats itself, instead of drawing this out on a plane again and again and again, we could have put it on a cylinder. The sine has one period, and its geometry wraps around. It's implicitly cylindrical. While the circle has a simple periodicity, the lemnus gate has two distinct periods. This double periodicity is similar to a variety of early computer games, like the one you see here. This is like the sine in its repetitive nature, so let's simply twist it into a cylinder. Now that motion makes sense. But we still have a problem with the top and bottom motion. What if we connect them too? The previously unusual behavior on the plane is totally natural when we use a torus. It was the geometry that was implied by the action all along. That's analysis situs. So the dynamic domain of the lemnus gate, or the game, which are periodic in two different ways, are implicitly toroidal. Riemann showed that the domains of the higher functions develop new geometries in the same way that we went from a plane to a cylinder to a torus. the unseen dynamic geometry of their internal relationships could be understood topologically by these surfaces in a way that would never occur to someone by simply looking at the formulas. The shapes we see here are the shapes of their characteristic action. Riemann's approach allowed the fundamental incommensurability of each of the series of abelian functions to be represented topologically as a new surface characteristic as a continuous series of changes. So, think about these changes in terms of the ongoing development of the universe 
and the increasing power of mankind's creative reason. Using the freedom afforded him by Dirichlet's principle and the surface characteristics that he discovered, Riemann was able to look at the higher transcendentals not as writing on a piece of paper, but as increasingly complex geometric spaces, becoming more dense in their interconnectedness. This characteristic of ongoing changes, each of which seems incommensurable to what came before, expressible only as a metaphor, began to develop a higher continuity that lay outside the series of changes themselves. This ongoing series of development, seen as the characteristic of the universe as a whole, the increasing power of the biosphere of the Earth, or the continuing progress of the human species, this development is itself the truest substance. It's more substantial than what your senses tell you. It's more real. Individual human beings, unlike all of life outside of us, have the opportunity to participate in that creative motion. Such an immortal life, functionally immortal, like that of the greatest inventors, scientists, discoverers, musicians, playwrights, engineers, and poets of the past, this is the highest responsibility of government. The greatest mission of the nation state is to ensure its citizens not only the opportunity to have a standard of living required to pursue such aims with dignity, but the cultural and scientific trajectory to allow its people to play what they can know now will be a role of lasting value in history. Without the baggage of oligarchy and monetarism, a credit system oriented economy can bring us to such a matured state of culture, throwing off the childish ways of the past and looking forward to the beautiful future glimpsed in such promises as NOAPA, space exploration, fusion research, to name a few. With such an outlook, we can even see a rebirth in the development of music, largely stalled since the death of Brahms. A final thought. How does the continually developing nature of creation, as expressed in recent LPAC videos, how does that square with the idea of a constant and eternal creator? Well, a simplistic view of an unchanging God, like a stubborn old man, that must give way to the continuity that lies behind and determines the creative shifts we see and create. As we move forward with real economic development, as we see what is actually constant through a change, we'll discover more about the true nature of the human personality and about the universe whose essential character we embody. A last riddle for you. While we see discoveries as discrete events, as shifts or jumps, we also know that this continuity exists. What's the nature of this continuous change? Do you have a name for the answer to that riddle?